Audible is my, my road trip companion. It's kind of my quiet alone time. Audible is a, is a routine for me. It's like a fun night school for adults. I could easily be seduced into locking myself in a place where I do nothing but listen to books. <laughs> I never was interested in historical fiction before, but I'm obsessed with it now. There are a lot of like classic and big titles that I, I feel like I've missed out. Since I don't have time to read, I might as well listen. If I want to catch up on the news or history or learn what's going on in the world, I can download a book and listen to it. Because I listened to her story over and over again, I made the decision to go ahead and follow my own dream, which was to help other veterans. I think there's like 180 books in my, in my library now. It changes your perspective. It makes you a different person. It's true. It's so true. <laughs> Download Audible and start listening today. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to the 25th Annual Festival of Books and this virtual event, Do People Have the Power? Electoral Politics and Democracy, presented by USC. I'm Bob Shrum, the Warshaw Chair in Practical Politics and the Director of the Center for the Political Future here at USC Dornsife. Our panel features Paul Adler, Professor of Management and Organization, Sociology and Environmental Studies at USC, and author of The 99% Economy, How Democratic Socialism Can Overcome the Crises of Capitalism. Jane Jun, USC Associates Chair in Social Sciences, Professor of Political Science and Gender and Sexuality Studies. And John Matsusaka, Professor of Finance and Business Economics at USC, and author of Let the People Rule, How Direct Democracy Can Meet the Populist Challenge. Before we start, let me say, please remember to support your local independent bookstores during the festival. I think I'm gonna open this by asking each of you to talk for about five minutes about your work or your books. And maybe we'll start with Paul Adler. Uh, thanks, Bob, and really delighted to be with you all tonight. Um, uh, the question is a really uh, a beautiful one that uh, is posed to the panel tonight. Do people have the power? And I'll hold down the end of the conversation with a straightforward answer of no. Um, my book uh, deals with uh, six recurring and deepening crises. I, uh, I look at uh, economic irrationality, workplace disempowerment, government unresponsiveness, environmental unsustainability, social disintegration, international conflict. And I show that they're pretty much inevitable as long as our economy takes a capitalist form. Where people, where businesses compete for profit rather than cooperate under a common plan. Uh, take the climate crisis. We have perhaps a decade to get the U.S. and other advanced economies to zero emissions, or else, or else all hell will break loose and civilization as we know it will disappear. To forestall that kind of disaster, uh, within the next decade, we need not only to shut down the fossil fuel industry but also radically transform all the products and production processes in all the various industries that use fossil fuels or otherwise add to our emissions, transportation, agriculture, mining, lumber, cement, plastics, construction. And on top of that, we need to rebuild a huge proportion of our infrastructure. I think it's pretty, it's crazy to think that we can make a transition like that by relying on a carbon tax of 50 or 100 or even $400 a ton, as if that was gonna nudge business in the right direction energetically enough and fast enough. And my proposition is simple. Any government that tried to regulate and tax the private sector to the extent that you'd need to make that kind of environmental transition happen fast enough would put out of business vast bands of the business sector. And not surprisingly, the business community would resist mightily any of the sort of serious moves that we need towards eliminating emissions. So my proposition is simple. As long as the prosperity of our country depends on the profitability of the private enterprise business sectors, our political leaders are restricted to whatever is compatible with that constraint. As a result, no, people don't have the power. Our democracy is terribly limited by the power of business. And that's not a question of donations and lobbying. That's a question of structural power, a reliance on the profitability of the business sector to ensure the profitability, the prosperity, I should say, of the country. The only way we can meet this challenge, I argue in my book, is to assert democratic control over the country's productive resources. 
we need to extend democratic decision making from the political sphere to the economic sphere. And I totally get that that's never been done before in any way that we'd like to emulate. We've had socialist planning in the past, but it's never been, it's never been in a democratic form. It's only ever been in a very autocratic and ugly form. But that doesn't mean it can't be done. And I think we have something of a challenge on our hands uh, in thinking about w what that might look like. So in my book, and just to summarize in a sentence, the thesis of the book is that we can get a pretty good idea of what that planned economy might look like in its democratic form if we look inside some of our more advanced corporations. These corporations have many business units. The corporation orchestrates the work of those business units in a, what we call a strategic management process so that they're all working towards common goals of the entire enterprise. And my argument is we could take those same strategic management tools scale them up to the economy-wide level and orchestrate the work of all our major industries and the major enterprises within them in the same strategic management process as we see operative in, or in a kind of microcosm of the big corporation today. So obviously to do that in a way that was genuinely democratic would be quite a challenge, uh, but I think we know we've learned a lot about what it would mean to retain democracy, to enhance democracy, and make it work at that vastly expanded level. I could expand, but I think you, you'd like to get other people introducing their ideas first. So why don't I stop there, Bob? Well, it was certainly provocative and interesting. Jane? Hey, Bob. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me today. I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to talk just a little bit about the book that I, uh, I am writing right now that will be out in 2021. It's simply called Women Voters. And when you ask the question of whether or not the people have the power, some people have power and others don't. And I think it's useful to always keep in mind just how uh, non-representative many of our institutions are, in particular our elected institutions, Congress, the US Congress remains stubbornly 25% female. Uh, that is both in the House and the Senate. And the same is true in the state of California where we have about 30% of our members in the Assembly and the Senate who are female. So let's just begin with that. I'll tell you just three points about this book. It's called Women Voters. It's an academic publisher. It tells the story, the dynamic story of gender and voting in the United States between 1964 and 2020. And I wonder if 1964 is just going to be one of the most interesting years for us to compare ourselves to. And we'll, maybe we can come to that into the question and answer. But the first thing that the book does is it identifies women as the most important voter in elections. Now, this dispels the historical mistruth that men are the default category of voters, because since 1964, there have been more women voters in the electorate than men. So if you think about who the modal voter was and you're thinking 1964, Maybe many of you think about Don Draper, character from Mad Men, right? It's actually the case that the modal voter in 1964 looks a whole lot more like Betty Draper, a white woman, Republican, divorced, living in the suburbs with kids and owning a gun. This is much more what the modal voter in the United States looks like. I think also it's the case that when we identify women as the most important voters in the American electorate, you can see also that they're important not only because they are mobilized more and they turn out at a higher rate, women do, but they're also likely to be swing voters, the most likely to be swing voters, namely changing preferences between parties. Let's not forget in 1964, what was Hillary Clinton? She was a Goldwater girl. The second thing that women voters does is demonstrates the vast heterogeneity of the women's vote. So to say that there is a women's vote is incorrect. So the book helps to dispel this notion that there's such a thing as all women having a central set of concerns. And in fact, one of the most important elements that differentiates women voters is race, where white women are consistently supporters of the Republican Party and only have done so, in other words, voted Democratic by a majority in 1964 and again in 1996. As you know, in 2016, white female voters supported Donald Trump the Republican candidate by a 9% margin. So what the book does then is dispel the notion that women are all the same and that there's one way to think about women voters. And finally, the third thing that the book does is it forges a new way to think about gender consciousness. We often think about feminist consciousness or women's consciousness as if it was within the context of say, the late great Ruth Bader Ginsburg. 
But at the same time, and as the Senate now considers the nomination of a Republican nominee, Amy Coney Barrett, to the Supreme Court, it seems quite clear that gender consciousness in support of traditional roles for women, in support of patriarchy, is a companion to gender consciousness on the feminist side. I think that what this innovation does in the book called Women Voters is that it helps to dispel the notion that Trump supporters are in some way pathological, that women who support Trump somehow don't have a good reason. They have a good reason. And that good reason is to support traditional roles for women, second in sex to men, perhaps first in race to people of color. Uh, John? Thanks, Bob. And it's great to be here with you and Paul and Jane, my esteemed colleagues at, at USC. Looking forward to this discussion. My book, my book can be boiled down to just two, two questions. The first is, why do so many people, not least Americans, feel that they've lost control of their governments? Uh, there's a lot of polling data out there right now that are telling us that people feel like this. It's across, it's not just in the US, but it's across Western democracies. It's something that's gone back. We can trace it back at least 50 years. Uh, but it's very clear that people feel, if you ask them, do you think you have a sane government? Do you think government cares about people like me? Um, we're getting increasingly n large numbers of people who say they, they don't feel they, the government cares about them and they don't feel they control it in some sense. This, this feeling, which has been much noted, has been part of the, part of the raw fuel for populists. Populist movements have been going on across the world. They have left-wing versions. They have right-wing versions. Many politicians are retailing their, their rhetoric now. Uh, in the US, uh, Trump, a uh, Republican, of course, uh, uses populist rhetoric quite often. Bernie Sanders used it on the left. Uh, populist rhetoric was common around the Brexit election in the United Kingdom, but it was, it was this general belief that, uh, or general assertion that the people somehow had lost control of government and it's been, it had been taken over by some sort of shadowy uh, group. So the, book, the book's answer to this question of why do people feel like they are losing control of government, which is the first part of the book, is that the, the book, the answer is very simple. It's that they have been losing control of government. So a big part of the book is to try to explain exactly how that's happened and why that's happened. In a nutshell, what's happened is that government has evolved, especially over the last 50 to 100 years, from a system where it used to be that the people would elect legislators who went in there and passed the laws that impacted people. What's happened over the last 50 to 100 years, though, is the government has dramatically evolved so that most laws now are made by unelected experts, either in the agencies, like the Environmental Protection Agency, or, or by courts. And the elected officials, say the Congress at the national level, have become more of sideshows for, for what's actually, actually happening. And so there's very good reasons why the governments have evolved in this way. It's, be, it's to deal with the increasing complexity and scope of the problems we're facing, but it's had this unintended side effect that it's, it's pushed people to the place where they don't feel like they have as much control over government. The other part of the book is to say, the other question is, what can we do about this? So the answer is that we need to retain experts in our government. We, we can't deal with the complexity and the scope of problems that we have without dealing with experts. The solution is, part of the solution is to overlay more popular control on top of the experts. So in particular, to bring the people more involved in the broad value decisions which, which drive the policy and leave it more to the experts to actually make the implementing decisions. What's, what's not really recognized, I think, among most Americans is how much of an outlier the United States has become in terms of democracies. We, we are one of a very few number of countries, about two or three now, that have never had a national vote on an issue. Everybody else in the world does this, except for the United States. Many people have heard of Brexit. They know this vote in the, in the, in the UK about joining the European Union. What they probably don't know is that Europeans do have, take votes like this all the time. Uh, there have been more than 50 votes on European in integration across Europe, including the UK, took one on its own in the 1970s. So it's very normal for everyone else in the world to ask the people to opine in on issues. The United States, we do that here in California. We do this at the, net, at the state level. We do it at the local level all the time, but we don't do it ever at the federal level. And that makes us a dramatic outlier. So what the book says is, let's just start by taking some advisory votes on major issues. We could go with immigration, for example. Uh, so it doesn't even have to be legally binding. Let the people say what they think about these issues. And this will leverage off the fact that polling data tell us that ordinary Americans are much more centrist than their elected representatives, uh, than their elites. Uh, ordinary Americans are much more willing to find middle grounds. They see issues as not so ideological. They're willing to compromise and come into the middle. Empowering them to be involved in decisions can cut through some of the partisan extremism that's there. And so the book 
all, like all forms of democracy, taking referendums has its own set of problems. And so part of the book is about unpacking those problems, explaining how we can manage them so, to make democracy work, work for us. But the overall theme is that we can actually improve some of the disconnect problems we have by creating opportunities for people to actually vote more on actual issues that are important to them. This is so interesting that I'm throwing out the questions I prepared. And I'm gonna ask you questions that come off of what you just said. Uh, I'll start with Paul, but anybody can come in on any of these questions. Uh, Paul, you're talking about really fundamental change. Uh, is there any prospect that you can actually get this done in the American political system? Yeah, I, I grant that the prospects look pretty slim. Um, my book asks the question, what would it take to address these big crisis problems that we face? Uh, and indeed, I don't see how we can, how we overcome these big challenges we face, such as uh, the climate crisis, without a really fundamental change. And the pathway is is, is uh, opaque. I sketched three of them in the concluding chapter of my book, but I don't claim to be a great expert on how to get from here to there. Uh, I tried to do my, I, I think what I added was some understanding of what there might look like. But if you ask me, how could we get from here to there? My answer would be, I think the pathway the only pathways I can see are through crisis. The environmental crisis might well prompt some conditional on some more enlightened leadership in Washington, might well prompt a quite radical transformation of the attitudes of the American electorate. Imagine a summer with three or four massive storms, with more fire, with more fires on the West Coast. We could, with some enlightened leadership in Washington, we could easily imagine. Hey, Tens of millions of people start fleeing Florida because they, they realize that Miami is going to be swamped in a few years and real estate is going to be worth nothing. In the face of massive environmental crisis like that, the economic crisis, the economic upheaval that would be attendant to it, I could imagine Americans changing radically their view of the appropriate powers of federal government. The other sort of crisis is purely economic crisis. We are we are in a capitalist world subject to recurring economic catastrophes. Um, this, uh, we, we sailed through a couple of decades of post-World War II prosperity without any major catastrophe, but I think we've gotten used to the idea that economic crises are just a part and parcel of the economic system we call capitalism. And at some point, people might well get uh, sick to death of a system that periodically throws out tens of millions of people and has tens of millions of people put in their homes. And the third form of crisis, I think, is also plausible, a political crisis. Imagine that someone like Biden is elected. Um, I imagine that he tries to implement some of the more aggressive uh, policy, more progressive policies uh, that, he's been, that he's been talking about closer, let's say, to the Green New Deal, at which point we might imagine a quite serious revolt in the business class, which could lead the Amer American to a political crisis where the American electorate is confronted with a choice of either moving backwards and retreating from these ambitions or moving forward to more comprehensive economic control over our productive resources. So I think, unfortunately, the pathway lies on, uh, through some form of crisis, economic, environmental, or political. Uh, Jane or John, do you have any response to that? So I, I'm, I'm glad Paul threw this, threw this idea out there. I think it'd be nice if people could actually vote on some of these things from time to time so we could find out what 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 they want. I, I'm sort of dubious, Paul, that you and I maybe talked about this, but I'm I'm dubious that if, if you ask people, look at the post office or look at veteran affairs, you want to scale that up to the whole economy, or would you rather keep or would you rather have more Teslas and Googles and, and so forth that they they're, that they're gonna choose, have kind of government run everything. But I, I think it'd be useful to let people vote on some of these things. Uh, let them have some some more control and uh, uh, you know get a little more spirit of, of experimentation. I'm kind of dubious that they would they will they will go they will go for that. I'm also dubious and I'm very nervous about the idea that we would make major structural changes in the midst of a crisis. I think that's not psychology and so forth tells us that's not a reason way to do it. You you lurch from things. We've seen historically countries have done dramatic things in crises that they have, that they regretted afterwards. So so I, that's not the leverage I would want to 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 move on this path. Jane, you have any any response here? You don't need to. I disagree with John, but um, let's move on. <laughs> why do you, you can't tell me why you disagree? Well, I disagree because uh, we shouldn't keep thinking about things the same way. That's precisely what Paul is trying to argue. The crisis provides the opportunity for innovation in ways, all the things that we took for granted, that we shouldn't take for granted. So I think we need to allow for dynamism. I think we need to allow for new voices, new ideas. So 
the one thing I agree with you on is that people should be more involved in this. And the, but I don't think that that involvement is always something that comes toward the middle. I think what the, one of the most enticing things about Paul's articulation is that in fact, what you're going to get and what you could get are some pretty revolutionary changes that may frighten some people, but you also have to recognize that the situation that we labor under today, not us, uh, people that work in universities with salary jobs, with the people that work in the service economy and elsewhere, they are suffering today. So I think that revolutionary change or something very different, uh, we might regret it at the top, but I'm not sure that others would elsewhere. And that could very well be precisely the time and the, the way that we need to move. Uh, Maybe I want to ask Go ahead, Bob. I was just going to uh, draw out John's thinking on this, because it seems like, if I understand your reasoning, John, it, 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 you think of politics a little bit like a free market where each voter is going to sort of maximize their utility and their choice when they've when faced with a referendum or initiative proposal, and that out of the free choice of these participants in this kind of marketplace of ideas, we're going to find some social optimum. And you know, when we're dealing with problems like climate change or the risk of systemic failure of our banking system, these are system-wide problems. And we know from basic economics that if individual actors maximize their own utility in a context where their interdependencies are so important that we're likely to achieve a very sorry, bad, ugly outcome rather than the desired outcome. So I'm, I'm, I'm I, I can well imagine in a, in, a, in a kind of socialist world that I'm that I'm imagining that there's a role for referenda and initiatives, but in the world that we live in today, when uh, so many of the big problems we face have this systemic quality, I don't quite see why you would expect individual voters faced with referenda or initiative type choices would make that in the aggregate their choices would reflect the desired future for society. Yeah. So yeah, I, I don't. There's no there's no perfect system, right? So it's the old Winston Churchill thing, you know, democracy is the worst form of government, except for all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. So I, I don't think that it leads to some to some optimum. I, I don't know a better answer is is the bottom line. I don't think we've ever come up with a better way to make to make collective decisions than than to say, look, we all count the same. We're all equal. We all have equal value. Uh, we all get to have a say. So I would not want to say I. 10 people or 100 people uh, just get to make the decision and force all of us down a path. I, I, I just think that's historically has, has, has you know, it, it, it can, you might get lucky, but historically, I, I think that's, 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 not, that's not a path that we want to go down and, and works out very, very well. So I, I think if you want to go down the path you want to go down to, which, I, you know, I, it's not, doesn't appeal to me, but I, but I think it ought to be on the table and, and, and people ought to have a say on it. But I, I think we have to go down a democratic path. I think that's one thing I think we all agree that we're not faced with a super abundance of democracy in our systems right now. And if we could do more of that, that might help us. I don't, I'm not saying it's a, it's a, it's a cure-all at all. You're, you're... Oh, I'm, I'm, I, I think we're agreed that democracy is a, is a sine qua non here. The question is in the form of democracy that you're advocating with reliance so much more on direct democracy and individual voting uh, rather than representative democracy. It seems like you've got a, you're envisaging a system that doesn't leave much room for legislators to deliberate together, to change each other's appoint opinions, to develop coherent packages of policies that address our longer term issues, lo lo that take a longer term perspective than the average citizen reflecting on their own personal needs might be willing to take. Uh, let, me, let me turn this to Jane and ask her, are women voters on balance a force for change or a force against it? I think I just told you that women voters are not one thing. They're not a monolith. No, on balance, on balance. They're a little bit of both, right? So okay. there have been, let's not forget, this is 100 years since the, in fact, I believe it is just this August that it's the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. And you could argue that for the 50 years following that, not much changed in politics. When things begin to change is in the 1960s, right? And women do become a force for change. Women aren't the only force for change. I mean on the left and on the right. So in general, I guess if the question to you is that you're posing to me is compared to whom, compared to men, I think probably yes, overall, in the sense that women have not had seats of power to the same degree as men have. I think of what you can do is look at legislation and changes in policies as a function of the inclusion of women into the not only the electorate, but also into uh, the House and Senate 
at the federal level, but also at state levels, which you'll see is the introduction of a host of policies, social, economic, political, that have helped to transform how we think about politics today. And that has happened, not coincidentally, during the time in which women have become the dominant voter in American politics, but still lagging in terms of formal political leadership. Uh, is there any chance that white women might break the pattern and vote Democratic this year? I think um, Bob and I actually have a bet about this. I think we have <laughs> yeah. a stake. Our last webinar, we, uh, we discussed this. Uh, he seems to think that they will. And uh, I hate to go on the record, but I'm going to. I don't think they will. I want you to remember that there have only been two elections since 1964. It's actually since 1952 that white women have voted majority Democratic, or at least more Democratic than Republican. That's 1964, when you have Barry Goldwater on the ticket versus Lyndon Johnson. And let's remember, I believe in that election, Goldwater wins with something like, what, 38 or 39 percent of the vote. It's the lowest popular vote total. And the largest is a huge electoral college landslide for Johnson. And um, also the uh, ironic thing is that it is Bill Clinton in 96 who takes not a majority of women voters, but more white women voters than the Republican did. And that's also a time during which we had a third party candidate. I do think that it's difficult for people to push off of their typical partisan identifications. And I know that people want to see the suburban uh, college educated white woman going Democratic, but nine points is a lot of ground to make up. So in other words, in 2016, white female voters supported Trump by a 9% margin over Clinton, a demographic representative who matched them, a white woman. So I think that while that margin will be closed, I, I'm not sure that uh, white female voters will support Biden over Trump, but I think it's going to be a lot closer. Uh, and John, I, I want to talk a little more about this national referenda idea, uh, because we live in California, and we have referendums and initiatives and ballot measures all the time. And I watch the television ads, and they bear very little resemblance to what's actually in the propositions. You're told, for example, that rent control will drive people out of their homes. Uh, how, what are the dangers of a national system of referenda? And is that going to massively expand the power of special interest money in our politics? This is a really good question. I, I'm not, I don't think it would make sense to start off with something like initiative process, which we have in California, where people can, ordinary citizens can collect signatures and propose, propose issues that go to a vote to become a law on their own. I, I don't think that's where we, should, where we should start. I think the where we should start is we should start with Congress calling votes on particular issues that they find of interest. There have been, uh, Congressman Dick Gephardt proposed an idea like, like this at one point. There's there's always a prob the problem of misleading campaign uh, advertising. There's always the problem that some people have money and they, they get to dominate, uh, they get to have more of a voice on, on the airways and, and online and so forth. But that's true, for, that's true for all forms of democracy. That's true for presidential elections. That's true for state elections. That's, that's true for everything. So I, it, it's, it's something that concerns me, but I don't think it's, it, it's any worse for, for direct democracy, for referendums than, than for anything else. It just, it just needs to be watched and managed and you need to have a competitive environment so that people have so, so the people can hear both sides of the issue. The, the evidence is pretty good. People have been studying this for a long time. The evidence is if people get to hear both sides of the issues, they end up coming down pretty much voting to reflect. Uh, they vote. They understand what they're voting on ultimately, and they're able to cast a vote that reflects their interests. We may not like what they vote, what they do. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But but there's very little strong evidence that suggests they're making they're, they're making systematic mistakes in, any more than they do in any kind of a, other democratic exercise. So. What we're describing here, I guess, or what you guys are describing, is not only an unequal distribution of political power, given the nature of our politics and the influence of money, but also historic levels of economic inequality, existential threats in terms of climate change. I'd like to ask each of you, what are the realistic prospects that we can at least begin to write this over the next few years? That question can't be that tough. <laughs> it's a hard question, Bob. Yeah. 
So well, I'll, I'll just go, because uh, I'll give them time to think, <laughs> which I'm sure what they're doing, they're trying to formulate their answers, which I was doing. But I, I'm, not a, I'm not a pessimist, ultimately. Uh, I think that we, we have the ingenuity and we have the willpower and we have the resources to, to, to solve problems. I think we are in a, a particularly troubling time because our political system, for reasons that we don't really well understand, has become hyper-partisanized and, and hyper-gridlocked. So, so we can't quite... Um, we, we find it very difficult uh, to to find middle grounds to to find to find compromises. I I've, I don't know how we're going to get out of that. Um, uh, I think what hopefully there will be. Uh, I don't think it's going to be one giant change. I think we're going to chip away at this in a bunch of different ways, at the local level, at the state level, and in various pieces. We will continue to reshape our institutions and make them more democratic. You know, Jane Jane was mentioning uh, women's suffrage, which was an innovation. One thing that people kind of don't 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 have in the front of their mind as much as they should is that American democracy. We've always evolved it. We've always kept changing it. We've always made it more and more democratic. When we started, you know, we didn't elect the president. We didn't elect governors. You had to have property to vote. You had to be white. You had to be male. You know, we, we've gradually made our system more and more democratic, and I think we'll continue to do that, and I think we've learned that that's a good thing, actually. Uh, the more, uh, all these all these arguments that people gave about all the bad things that would happen if you let people actually ha uh, self-govern have, have turned out not, not, to be, not to be the concerns that people thought they were originally. Can we get to where we need to go, in your view, I mean, the places you think we need to be, uh, with incremental change? which seems to be very much the American way of doing business and doing politics. Paul? Uh, Jane, I've, either? Yeah, I'm, I'm not seeing how we get there, except insofar as these incremental steps, which I'm all for. I, you know, I'd love us to move towards a more mixed economy, more regulated industry, and so forth. But, but I don't think they can get us where we need to go and, uh, unless and until they provoke a political crisis that opens up more the prospect of more radical change. Um, and for the reasons I explained uh, from the get-go, that as long as we're in an economy that is held at ransom by the business sector, uh, then this, the democracy is uh, largely vacuous. Jane, uh, let me ask you a about something we haven't brought up yet, but that I think underlies a lot of this. We are a divided country. The divisions are deep and bitter right now. What role does racism play in this? And what about cultural alienation as society itself moves in a different direction than the old America on issues like women's rights, police reform, and LGBT equality? Okay, let me answer that by also giving something to the previous question, which is that, you know, the, the invocation of the idea of existential threat being out there and how it is that incremental change versus something much more structural and fundamental can address these issues. I think it's important to keep in mind that every generation, every time people think that this is the worst of times. We think that some of these things have never happened before. We think that racism has never been worse. We think that, uh, economic conditions have never been more challenging. And we think that the pandemic is unique. And they aren't. I mean, there are different sets of problems. And uh, on the one hand, as John noted, we have dealt with them in the past. But at the same time, as Paul noted, we're structurally uh, contained by the economic system that we have. So what I want to know is that you know, there have been times, if you just look back to 100 years ago, in 1924, we passed something called the National Origins Act which essentially stopped all immigration to the United States from any country that wasn't Northern European and considered to be good white people. So bad, the bad whites, the less than whites, those who were discriminated against heavily were Jews, Italians, Irish, those groups of Americans, which now everybody thinks is, are white. So the idea of racism has been persistent and an essential trait of the American experience. The founding document to the United States creates a place for African-Americans as chattel slaves and as property. They're not even spoken of as humans in the in many ways, in uh, and certainly not people with any rights. So I think that it's important to consider that none of these problems are new problems. We like to think of them as being new and the most difficult things and things we've never seen, but they are not. Um, what the question is for us is, have we been making progress? To what extent have we made progress? I think why we see the polarization today and this and in, in particular the alterations in how we think that everybody's at each other's throats. We've been each, at each other's throats forever. The question is, and that's kind of in the nature of democracy, 
the question for us is to say, what is the tip? Where is that tipping point of inequality where we reach something much more significant than just being arguing with one another about who they are to vote for? I think it's important to keep in mind that those structural inequalities and the perception of who is uh, sort of American and who can say what is American, who can say what is moral, whether it's using um, bathrooms that are made for everyone, non-gender specific bathrooms to uh, abortion rights or any of the others. But these are all issues that are new ones for today, but they speak to a longstanding element of democracy. We fight it out and we take whatever that tipping point of inequality is to then move us to the next level. I think there have been significant periods of time in which we've made major structural changes, industrial revolution, civil war, uh, World War I and II. These are periods of substantial structural change. I just don't know that we can see them yet, but I would echo Paul in saying I think the place where it's going to happen is, has to be in politics. Uh, Jane, you just looked back a hundred years and more. So I want to look forward 10 years. Uh, when USC hosts the LA Times Festival of Books on campus in 2030, will we as a society be fairer and more democratic? And what will the consequences be if we aren't? And I don't care who starts. I can call on somebody or you can, somebody can volunteer. Okay, John. I'll, I'll oh. give it a shot if you want, Bob. Um, yeah. To to and maybe this is a way also to return to one of John's ideas that the reason we see such sort of disaffection from politics is because experts have taken over and legislators have handed the reins to regulators and the courts. Um, I, I think we are at something of a fork in the road here. Um, whether it's the environmental crisis whether it's demands for racial justice, the, the Me Too movement, um, there's an accumulation of suffering here, as a, I would say, as a result of the mutations of capitalism over the last 50 years. Um, you know, starting, you can, you, can, you can trace a fairly clear decline in the average profitability of American industry going, starting at around, well, by, by, very clear by 1970. And ever since then, American business has been struggling to crush unions, to assert more unilateral power, to deregulate across, uh, across you know, through the federal government, uh, to pull back on a range of advances that were made in a somewhat more social democratic form of America that we had there in the post-World War II period. And the accumulation of suffering wrought by this neoliberal turn of American society over the last 30, 50 years is massive. Um, You've seen the data on growing inequality. Okay, inequality is one thing, but but look at what's been going on for the bottom 50% of American society, the bottom 70% of American society, how limited their advances. The prospect of seeing their children have a worse life than themselves. Nothing will get people more angry than the idea that all the suffering that they went through for themselves will yield for their kids an even more miserable life. And we are at that fork in the road. And you ask a terrific question, where might we be in 2030? I think we're at something of a fork in the road, either a mus more, much more muscular form of social democracy with much more aggressive regulation and government guidance of economic activity, or a very dark future of authoritarianism in this country. Authoritarianism, I love John's optimistic vision of an ever-perfecting form of democracy here in the United States. And yes, there's been very real progress over the past a set couple of centuries, but there's also been terrible dark moments where the clock has been moving back, you know, in terrifying speed. And so I think we're at a bit of a fork in the road. Jane, where do you think that fork's going to take us? Are you hopeful? I think or? a lot of it depends. I'm, you know, a little bit of both. I I think a lot of it depends on what happens in two weeks. It does have to depend on what happens in two weeks. Populism in the electorate got us what we got in 2016. And that populism has ignored experts who are public health experts. That to me is not a victory for democracy. And I think that a lot of it does matter where we're going to be in uh, hopefully soon after November um, and certainly in January. A lot of that depends. We are at that fork in the road. Do I think that things will be uh, better in 2030? I'm not sure. I think things will be better absent significant change uh, for people who are in the top 
10, 20, 30%, and much worse for those are, who are below. But to the point about experts and you know, courts and whatever taking over, I, I'm buoyed by what I see. Ordinary people, especially young people, Black Lives Matter, women's marches, young people doing what they're doing. I, I don't think that they that their actions are in vain. I think that what many of them are doing are the agent of change. I don't know the political parties are gonna be the only agent of change or the courts for that matter. I think that to the extent that we see that kind of activity, it doesn't have to be in voting. It can be in the many, many other forms of participation that young people and others, progressive people, possibly conservatives as well, taking, taking action on their own changing their communities from the ground up. So I'm optimistic about that. Some of the questions we're about to get to from uh, the viewers, by the way, go to this whole notion of what's gonna happen in two weeks. Uh, John, do you have a last word on this? Well, I was just gonna say on, on, on the 10 year out thing, just, just very, very quickly, because I know you wanna go to questions, but I, I think first of all, we, we should recognize that it's super, super hard to predict. Uh, you would have asked us all you know, a year ago, what would we be talking about? What would thing? We, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have mentioned COVID at all. And so stuff just happens to us if there was a, a major war breakout that will dominate the next decade if there was a war. So, so I think there's all kinds of things that could happen that, that we don't know. I think the encouraging thing is that we have, uh, we have a free society, we have a society, a prosperous society, we have an educated society. I, I think that most Americans are fed up with, uh, with the, I think there's a there's an extreme amount of partisanship of uh, infighting that I think it, most Americans are are, are fed up with. Uh, they don't they don't actually want part of it. I don't think it really represents where most people are. The question is, can 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 there be some way to diffuse that by a, a, again, in some sense, my best idea at this point is is to get the people more involved in it because maybe they can take some of the partisanship out of it. But it is really seeping down into 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 the ordinary people as as well, and people are getting more and more partisanized. I think we do have to get get out of that in, in some kind of way in order to be able to deal with the problems. Because we can't, we can't deal with anything now because everybody's just focused on who's going to win on November 3. Is it my side or the other side? Uh, and everybody thinks if I give power, then, uh, then it's going to be heaven. If the other side, it's, it's, we're going to go down the tube. And this happens every four years. And it's been happening for at least you know 20 years now. And I think we should learn at this point, it's, it's not as simple as that. It's not just my side winning and we're, we're going to have happiness. We, 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 we need to do something more structural. Yeah, it, it's interesting. Uh, it's a common line. This is the most important election of our lifetime. Uh, it may actually be true this year, uh, at least from my perspective. I tend to agree with Jane on that. Okay, we're going to turn to questions. Uh, and our que first question is from Diane. Uh, what do you think about giving the right to vote to 16-year-olds, to high school students? Or don't you? Well, you know, we had the 26th Amendment. We had to have a constitutional amendment in 19, I believe it's 1971, during Nixon. You guys, Nixon, okay? And it, it, it goes through Congress, just whoops right through Congress, and it gives 18 to 20-year-olds the right to vote. And I think, it, what, was the, what was the tagline for it? Old enough to fight, old enough to vote. I think that was a pretty different time. Um, and I don't know what 16, what the relevance of 16 means. It's the driving age in California. That may not be such a great idea either. I think it's, I'd be open to thinking about it and I'd be open to hearing her arguments for it. Anyone else? We're, drawing, we're picking these arbitrary numbers like 18 or 16. They're all they're all sort of arbitrary. Uh, my own in, my own instinct is that that's it's 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 second order. It, it depends. I'd like to I'd like to hear the arguments, but but my my instinct, if you did that, it doesn't change much of anything. The system goes on more or less it is. So I guess if people wanted to reform things, I would I would I would actually want to reform some other things first because I think you get you get more of a of, of a change from other other directions. Okay. Speaking of that, we have a question from Jim. And this may be more first order. How likely do you think it, it is that our electoral college system is going to change? I know what I think, but. <laughs> what do you think, Bob? The, the prospects of that are almost non existent. You need a two thirds majority of Congress, you need three quarters of the states. You're not going to have small states give up their power. Uh, it's, it's, just not going to happen. I mean, we're going to talk about it and talk about it. Now, what if you ever had an election where somebody won by seven or eight points but lost in the Electoral College for president? That might be one of the kinds of crises that that uh, Paul talks about that would bring about some kind of change. But even then, I think you'd see incredible resistance from 
those smaller states. Now there is a there is a way around this, and it goes to a question from Tom. Can you speak about the movements that are taking place uh, to work around the Electoral College, like the National Popular Vote Bill? And I assume you all know what that is. When a majority of when states representing a majority of the Electoral College have signed on to an agreement that their electors will vote whoever wins the national popular vote. What do we think of that? So I'll just say briefly, I think in the long run, we will get rid of the Electoral College. We will get rid of, if you look at this, if you look at the, if you look at the trajectory of American history, we've gradually unraveled these undemocratic aspects. We'll get rid of the un, un, unequal, dramatically unequal representation of the U.S. Senate. I don't think it's going to happen any, anywhere soon because it has too many partisan implications right now. So as long as we are in a hyper-partisan world, then there's no prospect of movement on that. We will get out of this hyper-partisan world at some point. I don't necessarily think next year or the next five years, but there are periods in history where the partisanship declines. Those are the periods when we, I believe, will we'll unwind some of these anti-democratic things as we've done over time. We got rid of a lot of things that we never thought we could get rid of, and we will, but it, I think over a longer period of time. Maybe, maybe I'd add, just to, to go back to the original question of the Electoral College itself, the, um, and to pick up on a point that Jane made earlier on, it, it, it's certainly a very strange construction in this day and age to have the Electoral College the way it is. Um, on the other hand, one of the reasons it's been such a problem is because of the political polarization between the states. But, the states that are rather sparsely populated and enjoy this disproportionate power in the Senate are also, on average, pretty conservative states. Let's change that. You know, there are social movements afoot all across the country that can change people's political values and uh, you know, open up political debate ac across all of these states. And at that point, the, when the polarization between the states uh, recedes in importance, so will the Electoral College's negative impact on our political life. So many of the questions that are coming in are relate to the Electoral College. And the next one from Stephen is, how do you think the Electoral College system has impacted potential voters' decisions to vote or not, since many feel like their vote doesn't count? You know, you're an ardent Trumpite in California, your vote doesn't count, you can think. Well, I mean, I think that's an empirical question, too. And you can look at turnout rates by states, and you can see that it's not always the case. I mean, there there are multiple reasons why people feel their vote doesn't count. Maybe they think they're terrible candidates, which you could argue they're terrible candidates. Um, so I do think that if you look at turnout rates by state, you'll see some variation, you'll see some patterns in the incentive to vote as a function of whether it counts. But let's not forget that voting has multiple functions, not just in terms of how and who you pick uh, for the as the outcome, but in the act of doing it as a demonstration of a statement about one's role as a citizen. Just back to the other question on the Electoral College, it doesn't require constitutional change either. So if you might, so in some way relevant to the National uh, Voter Bill, the, that uh, popular vote bill that we, this, that one of the uh, participants asked a question about, it's also the case that not all states have a winner-take-all circumstance for their Electoral College vote. So Nebraska, uh, is different, and I believe it is, it's New Hampshire, right, that's different? Maine. Or is Maine. It Maine? It's Maine, Maine. and, and uh, Nebraska. And so it's not the case, it would be very difficult to, but because in the state of California, we, you know, Democrats don't want to give up their 55 votes. They don't want to give that up proportionally. So it's it's on both sides. And as both of the other panelists have noted, the polarization just only reinforces that. At the same time, it doesn't require uh, constitutional change for the Electoral College to match better the popular vote if states did, um, you know, altered their the format. And that's a, that's controlled by the states. It's not controlled by the federal government or the Constitution. Uh, we have another question from Leslie. What do you think about the possibility of a Republican state legislature in some state taking over the allocation of a particular state's electoral vote and saying, we're going to appoint the electors, regardless of how you vote. Almost well, happened I, in Florida in 2000. Almost happened in Florida. So I don't think it's, I think Leslie's bang on. I think that's a possibility. 
I, with all due respect, I, the question is a lot. What I think about a Republican legislature, I think it's bad any legislature doing that myself. I don't think it's any worse if a Republican legislature did it or Democratic legislature. I think it's, 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 it's not likely to happen unless, unless you have a very, uh, a very close uh, election where it looks like it's, uh, it looks like at least in the eyes of some of, of a large number of people that, that there's something corrupt or, or, or wrong in the way the votes were counted, which is what, which is what, what, what happened in Florida. But I don't think, you know, no, no legislature should do that nowadays. Uh, well, it's not a question of should. I mean, no president should try to shake down the Ukrainian president over the phone. You know, no, no president should, and no Senate should confirm a Supreme Court justice, you know, uh, one week before a federal election. But John, those things have happened right now. It may be the more general point to make, and perhaps this is consistent with John's view too, is that the, so much of the machinery of our electoral system is just so decrepit. Um, the, the, the fact that these, are con these election machineries are, are controlled by local folks with so little federal oversight, we, we just have a broken system across so many dimensions, we're gonna have to find some way sooner or later to bring it up to international standards you know, any other country that had our system would have been, the, the elections would have been decreed unfair from, get, from the get-go. Okay, our last question actually comes from Bob. Uh, if we make some progress on some of these issues, on the terms of the things you guys have been talking about, what can we do about a Supreme Court that may strike down not just campaign finance reform, but any major steps designed to redress economic inequality and rein in uh, corporate power. Jane just mentioned the court, and I think, John, you're talking about unrepresentative institutions, yeah, and I, we may have a court with a lot of power. I think we have a problem that we have a court that is now in the lawmaking business, and uh, um, there, it's nine unelected people with lifetime appointments, and um, um, I think it's ultimately unhealthy. Other democracies don't 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 do this. Uh, and um, unfortunately, I think where we are now is that I noticed the partisans, they really like the court making decisions when it makes decisions they like. They really don't like it when when the other party has control of it. I, I think the, I think that's not the way we should be making important decisions. Uh, I, I just wrote something recently about abortion policy, for example. That was a decision that was made in the U.S. by courts. It was made in, in most other countries by, by legislatures or by, by referendums. I think that when we have these courts coming in, making decisions in non-democratic ways, we're just asking for trouble. I, I'll agree with John on that. I think that's... I'm sorry. I'll agree. I, I wanted, just wanted to express my agreement with John on that. I think it's uh, a very peculiar feature of the American system today that we've handed off so much legislative authority to the court system. It's very unhealthy, uh, and it, it's got to change. The legislators have to stand up and play their role in shaping laws and not, uh, not relinquishing their authority to the courts. Jane, you mentioned the courts, so I'd be happy to give you the last word about this Supreme Court and how it's likely to play in terms of all the issues we've been talking about tonight. Well, you know, folks, uh, democracy and American democracy is its own animal, right? And our ideals or the thoughts about what it is that's supposedly good democratic or not have evolved over time. The court has, from time to time, been essentially powerless to being very powerful in certain periods. And that balance of power between the three branches is continuously at work. It's a dynamic thing at work. At some point, and to the extent that um, like, I just think that one of the best examples here is the Voting Rights Act. So you have, you know, Shelby County versus Holder, and that decision, in essence, well, what it does is it strikes down the provisions of the Voting Rights Act for preclearance. And what does Congress do? Nothing, right? So the solution to a problem of the court taking too much power, if that's your position, whether it's from the left or from the right, is for the 535 lawmakers at the federal level to do their damn job and to create legislation that speaks to whether that issue is voting rights or abortion or same-sex marriage or economic issues, structural questions or the environment. That's what Congress is supposed to do to make the laws. And then we, of course, would have to have a president that executed them uh, properly. Okay, we're running out of time. John or Paul, do you have anything to say on this one? Because I would think, John, you of all people, go ahead, Paul. 
I'm with Jane. <laughs> I think she, Jane nailed it. <laughs> what she said. Yeah. John, anything else? I, I don't. I would like. I would like Congress to come in and do more, but I, I think structurally that's 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 not uh, that's not going to work at this point. I, I just wish we would. Uh, I think part of the root problem, and we don't have time to go into this, but but part of the problem is it's way too hard to amend the U.S. Constitution, and so we clearly can't update our core our core laws through democratic processes anymore. So the courts have come in and filled the gap. Uh, they had to do it. Somebody has to do it. I think that we, we at some level, we got to figure out a better way to amend the Constitution, like all other countries do, update it every few years, keep keep it viable, but don't turn it over to nine unelected people to do the updating. Let's have some more democratic process to do it. Okay. This has been a really fascinating panel. I want to thank Jane, John, and Paul. You should go out and buy John's book. You should buy Paul's book. And next year, you should buy Jane's book on the women voter. Uh, I want to thank all of you for tuning in and being part of this panel on the uh, of the Festival of Books. And all I want to say is buy books, read books, and buy them from your independent bookstore. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Bob. Thank Thanks, you. Bob. Thanks, everyone.